This is a true story. Every detail and every fact is taken from contemporary accounts. This is the story of the last witch to be tried, convicted and condemned to death in England. Her name, Jane Wenham, the witch of Walken. It's the 12th day of March in the year of our Lord 1712. Jane Wenham is in the Hartford Court of Assizes on trial for witchcraft. The public gallery is packed. <laughs> Standing in the dock, she is what you imagine when you think of a witch. She's a woman, 70 years old, ugly, emaciated. She's not meek and mild. She's cantankerous and argumentative and single-minded. The case isn't complex. The evidence is overwhelming. The first witness is Farmer Chapman. He says he knows. Everyone knows Jane is a witch. Why, my little party's just beginning. One of Farmer Chapman's farm hands, Matthew Gilston, entered the witness box and swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He says, on New Year's Day 1712, Jane suddenly appeared. She asked to buy a penny's worth of straw. He said no, and she said, I'll have justice some day in some other way. Then on the 29th of January, Gilston says an old woman in a hood suddenly appeared and asked to buy a penny's worth of straw. Again, he refused. The woman said again, I'll have justice some day some other way. Suddenly Gilston found himself running and running for miles and miles. Totally out of control, he threw himself into a huge dung heap. He ripped off his own shirt and started pulling straw out of the cow poo. He then found himself running home with the stinking straw. When Farmer Chapman heard what had happened, he confronted Jane. He called her a bitch and a witch. Jane wasn't having any of that. On the 9th of February, Jane stormed into the office of the local magistrate, Sir Henry Chauncey. Now this guy, was very knobby. He was a big deal. Chauncey looks down on Jane and says, it's not my problem. He refers Jane to the local minister, the Reverend Mr. Godfrey Gardner. Jane meets the vicar on the 11th of February. He's not sympathetic at all. He orders the farmer to pay Jane 5p, a derisory amount. To add insult to injury, he tells Jane to stop being so bloody quarrelsome. Gardner hears a saying, I'll have justice some day in some other way. One hour later, Reverend Godfrey Gardner, his wife Deborah, and the Reverend Francis Bragg hear a horrifying scream from the kitchen. They rush in and 17-year-old maid Anne Thorne is stripped to her underwear, howling, wringing her hands and incapable of speech at her feet oak twigs wrapped in her dress laying on the cold stone floor. The poor girl says that an old woman in a hood had suddenly appeared. She found herself running and running. She leaped over a five-bar gate when all of a sudden she stopped. She found herself talking to Jane Wenham on Hackney Lane. She ran all the way back to the house with a big bundle of twigs. All this in seven minutes flat. Anne Thorne had a bad knee, yet John and Daniel Chapman corroborated her story. Mrs. Deborah Gardner, the rector's wife, told the court the twigs were magical charms. Witches hide sticks and feathers in victims' households. The only way to break such a spell was to burn them fire of magical charms would drag a witch to its flames and sure enough as the twigs were burning Jane Wenham was at the door. The 13th of February Jane was arrested on the orders of Sir John Chauncey. The law had recognised the existence of magic and sorcery since the 8th century. He was on solid legal ground. There were of course sensible grown-up tests to determine if someone was a witch. The vicar of Audley, the Reverend Mr. Strutt, got her to recite the Lord's Prayer. Jane got the words wrong, a sure sign 
of the witch. The maid, Anne Thorne, tried to draw blood from Jane's forehead by scratching her, but there was no blood. Which John Chauncey's son pricked Jane's skin with a long pin and he too failed to draw blood. A sure sign of a witch. Jane's urine was put in a sealed stone bottle and placed in a fire. When the urine boiled, witnesses swore Jane writhed in pain. When the bottle exploded, she was visibly relieved. Which In court, witnesses testified that black cats had been seen with Jane's head on them. One cat had a knife. Another was heard to urge the maid, Anne Thorne, to take her own life. Reverend Gardner's servants tell the court under oath they've seen marks and bruises on the maid, Anne Thorne, but of no cause. A farmer swears Jane stole a turnip, and the next day, one of his sheep died. She's a witch. On the 16th of February, the Reverend Strutt and Gardner interview Jane. And she confesses. She admits bewitching the maid and Thorn. She admits entering a pact with the devil 16 years previously, only days before her husband died. The devil had come to her disguised as a black cat. In those days, there were no defence lawyers. I would have been out of a job, but there was a judge and a jury. The judge hearing this case is Chief Justice Sir John Powell. He's a rational man in a time when science is beginning to flower. Jonathan Swift described him as the merriest old gentleman I ever saw. Chief Justice Powell clearly thought the case was dumb. The judge ordered the jury to find Jane not guilty. The case was absurd. The evidence was circumstantial at best. Just because Jane turned up when you were burning a few twigs doesn't mean she's a supernatural entity. Feathers are hardly unusual things to find in a pillow. Trying to stab or scratch the forehead of a shriveled 70-year-old malnourished woman with a pin probably isn't going to produce a tsunami of blood. It's not a great surprise that an old illiterate lady facing the death penalty fluffed the words of the Lord's Prayer. The jury went away to consider their verdict. They returned only two hours later. Guilty. Under the 1604 Witchcraft Act, the penalty for anyone who shall consult, covenant with, entertain, employ, feed or reward any evil and wicked spirit to or for any intent or purpose is death. The judge had no choice in law. He had to sentence Jane to death. Ah, you cursed brat! Look what you've done! The case caught the public's imagination. The witnesses in the trial weren't just illiterate, uneducated, superstitious country bumpkin villagers. Oh no, three clergymen gave evidence against Jane. So did the wife of a clergyman. The Justice of the Peace, Sir Henry Chauncey, testified along with his son and his grandson. Educated people were accusing Jane Wenham of being a witch. The judge, Sir John Powell, had a problem. The law was wrong and he knew it. What to do? Rather than sending Jane straight to the gallows as the law demanded, he immediately reprieved her. Then he helped her escape the village and he got Queen Anne to issue a royal pardon. Powell is a proper legal hero. Because of Powell, Jane's last years were comfortable, very comfortable. She lived on the estate under the protection of William I Earl of Cowper. He housed her, clothed her, fed her. He paid her a generous income. Jane died in 1730 at the age of 90. Still a celebrity. Her bones are somewhere in this graveyard. She was buried in an unmarked grave. But, but her life, her trial, her fame as the last witch of England led to the Witchcraft Act of 1735, a really badly named act of law. Under the new act, it was not a crime to be a witch. It was a crime to accuse someone of being a witch. It ended 200 years of hunting and executing witches in England. 
In England, 90% of witches who were executed were women. In a way, Jane Wenham wasn't just the last witch condemned to death by an English court, she was our first feminist. On that day, she had her justice in some other way.